So we're good. Okay, so welcome again to Ark Fellowship, and uh, let's begin with prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to meet together, Lord, in a world becoming increasingly wicked, increasingly oppressed, where truth, your word, your name, the very thought of you, Lord, is becoming something others want to call criminal. We thank you, Lord, that for us it is joy and life. So we pray, Lord, that you'll remember your covenant, that you yourself would be our teacher. We pray, Lord, that by your spirit, everyone that hears the things that you have me share, that you, Lord, will write in their hearts and minds and in their understanding and cause them, Lord, writing by the finger of God in them, engraving upon them, Lord, your law, your word, your truth, conforming them from the innermost being out to your son that they might be truly disciples and have a place at the wedding and have a place in eternity with you, reconciled to you through the blood of Jesus by the work of his ministry, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So tonight's topic is, once again, not John 7. I'm almost tired of saying that. <laughs> anyway, so I've entitled it, what did I entitle it? I put my old man glasses on. Blowing the trumpet, blowing the shofar, a warning from the Lord, because that's how it came to me. So the other day, God called me to prayer, like urgently called me to prayer. And he said I had to go, I had to come to prayer with my Bible. So I, I knelt there with my Bible and it says Deuteronomy 2. So I read that. Then he says, Jeremiah 9. So I read that. And then he says, Obediah. Obediah. Who reads Obediah? Do you know Obediah? When's the last time you read Obediah? So initially I was thinking, are you sure? Lord, that's Obediah. So Obediah it was. Read those things. And then he impressed upon me that it was a warning. You know, like not something for later not something to be taken lightly, but something that, and I really got the strong impression that applies to us, you know, those who hear this and who want the truth, that it's for us. So, I sat down thinking, okay, I need to write the study. What on earth have these things got to do with anything? So I, I prayed and I asked the Lord, explain. So to the best of my ability and the best of my faith, what I'll share now is what the Lord instructed me from those three scriptures and what it means for us. So we're going to now, Deuteronomy 2 is reasonably long, but fortunately it's a bit repetitive. So uh, I'm going to skip a good chunk of it out, which is simply repeats the first part over and over. So we're just going to read from Deuteronomy 2, verse 2, until verse 7. I'll read it. Then the Lord said to me, uh, just to put context, they're wandering in the wilderness, right? They haven't made it to the promised land yet, Israel. This takes place right at the end of the journey. So, that, so the promised land is really close. They don't know that, but God knows that they're almost there, right? Remember, they've been wandering for 40 years. But what God impressed upon me why we're here is because we may well be in a similar situation. Remember, the wilderness journey is a picture of the Christian life. This is not our home. This is The world is not our home. It's a hostile place full of snakes and scorpions, some of whom are our bosses, some of whom are our neighbours, you know. Some of whom are that person that yells at you in the car park or whatever, you know. This is not a friendly place for Christians, this world. It's the wilderness. We're not supposed to like it. We're not supposed to love it and embrace it and want to settle down as if this was our permanent home. We are, if you look at lots of old, really good Christian hymns from a hundred or a couple of hundred years ago, 
this was common, not this was properly understood in the church, because it appears in all the lyrics. You know, like Onward Christian Soldiers, that famous hymn, lots of hymns like that, right, which talk about the Christians being travelers on the move. You know, that we are passing through this life and this world to somewhere. So the old Christians really understood this. You know, not, he says, if anyone loves this world, they don't love God. That's the scripture, right? I'm thinking, what? You're not allowed to love the world? What it means is, if you think it's a good idea to have as your goal to have a comfortable life in the wilderness, <laughs> good luck with that. You know, but God's people are just passing through. He gives us the bread every day. Remember, that's what Exodus teaches us. Even though it's the wilderness, he gives us water in the desert. He gives us the, the bread every day and so on, all those things, right? So that whole 40-year walk from their initial rescue out of Egypt, that's what people don't understand. When you were saved, that was only the beginning of your being saved. That's leaving Egypt. Heaven is a big, long walk away through the wilderness, a really unpleasant place. So if you take, it, if you take your rose-tinted glasses off and have a look at the world, the world is a reasonably unpleasant place, right? It's the wilderness. That's why, that's why we're not to love it in the, set, in the way pagans do, as if this is it. This is not it for us. So this Deuteronomy 2 takes place right at the end of that journey, very close to the promised land. So picking up where we were. Then the Lord said to me, you have made your way around this hill country long enough. Now turn north and give the people these orders. You are about to pass through the territory of your relatives, the descendants of Esau, who live in Seir. That's a really mountainous region. High, well, by Israeli standards, mountains, we probably call them hills, but mountainous region. They will be afraid of you, but be very careful. This, this is the part that's for us. Be very careful. Do not provoke them to war. For I am not going to give you any of their land, not even enough to put your foot on. I have given Esau the hill country of Seir as his own. You are to pay them in silver for the food you eat and water that you drink. The Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He has watched over your journey through this vast wilderness. These 40 years the Lord your God has been with you and you have not lacked anything. You have not lacked anything. Notice here what God is saying to them. Up until now, he's been taking them by, if you go carefully through the scripture and plot it on a map, he actually sends them on this really tortuous roundabout route. Right? You know the 40-year journey, you can walk it in a straight line in about 10 days. So he took them in this long convoluted route and largely he avoided any serious enemies. But now he says, you've wandered around these hills enough. Now you're going to take this direct route. But you're going to have to pass through the land that I have given to people who are your relatives, but there's a problem. What's the deal with Esau? These are Esau's descendants, right? Who is Esau? He's somebody's brother. The brother of Jacob. Who is this who is this that God is leading? This is Israel, right? Who are the descendants of Jacob? How did Jacob and Esau get on? <laughs> Not well. Can you remember why? Esau is the elder. He should have inherited everything under Jewish inheritance law, right? He should have been the head of the family. He should have, he should have, he should have. But remember, 
he would say he was tricked, but actually it was his own attachment to this world, his own interest in his own stomach that lost him his inheritance. Remember, his brother said, tell you what, you give me your inheritance and I'll cook you this food. Red lentil stew, remember. And he's like, deal. Because he's never thinking about eternity. He's only thinking about filling his stomach here and now, right? So he thinks, ah, oh, deal. It's only later when God upholds that and causes Jacob to receive the blessing on the death of his father and inherit that position. Esau's really, really angry. He's angry with Jacob as if it's Jacob's fault. Whose fault was it? His own. He didn't take an eternal view. He thought that his, you know, here and now and today was what mattered. You know, I'm hungry, so yeah, sure, just cook me food. You know, filling his belly lost him his inheritance. That's an important picture of so much of the church today. They think, you know, we talk about people whose Jesus is like the vending machine in the sky. They think he's there to serve them, to make their life here full. You know, like the hell song sort of Jesus. That's Esau. They don't have an eternal view. They just assume they're going to heaven. They just assume they're going to inherit, right? But their relationship with God is about give me, give me, give me, because I'm interested in my life, like, now. I want to be wealthy. I want to be comfortable. I want, I want, I want, I want. And you're the big bending machine in the sky. So in Jesus' name, I'm pressing, you know, B6 on the vending machine, and I expect whatever that is to drop out of the, into my hands, right? That's Esau. What we have to understand in Deuteronomy 2 is God is saying to them, I'm about to take you through the land that I've given to Esau and his descendants. The feud is not really over. He's basically saying, I'm about to take you through really dangerous territory, even though they're your relatives. So strictly the, you know, cousins or I'm no good at the whole ancestry thing, but relatives, right? But they're not friendly. They are used to God being with them, and they are used to whatever's in the way. If someone attacks them, like God will deal with them. So everywhere, as long as God was with them, there could not really be in any harm. Right? But here, note what God says. I have given them this place. It's not yours. You must not provoke them into battle. What does provoke mean? You must not be the start of trouble. You know? You must be not the one that starts the war. You might be the one that finishes it, but you must, you must not be the one that starts it. In fact, you must pay them for the water that you drink and you must pay them with the, for the food that you take passing through this land. All right. It says specifically you have to pay them in silver. Do I include that part? I know that's in the scripture, but I'm not sure if I had it in... Uh... Oh, yes, verse 6. You have to pay them in silver for the food you eat and the water that you drink. Does anyone know why silver? It's to do with redemption normally, but here it has a slightly different meaning. So if you're a, a, a metallurgist, if I have a gold bar and a silver bar and I put them outside for 200 years, what will I find when I come back? I'll find all of the gold bar and some of the silver bar. Why? Gold doesn't react with anything. It's permanent. Silver oxidizes. That's why if you buy a Divisoria gold, I'm oh, sorry, silver bangle, you go to Green Hills special 
jewelry market for a silver bangle and, you know, and then you go by the sea or something like that and then it goes gray yeah. right it's because it's got just the thinnest possible layer of silver on it and that will oxidize really quickly right so what it's meaning here is don't worry that you're going to have to pay what you're paying them is something that has no future anyway you, you can happily give it away because it's not permanent you understand it's perishing like the world that's actually supposed to be our attitude towards money we're supposed to be wise managers of it but we're not supposed to cling to it as if it had some eternal value it has a momentary value but not in the long run you know not in the long run why is this important well we'll see in a minute so this is the beginning of Deuteronomy 2 and it's the people he says you must pass through don't be the cause of trouble don't start any fights just pass through pay your way in silver for the reason we just mentioned and he would lead them through so not going through in their own remember because he's led them all the way that doesn't stop that when we go into the rest of Deuteronomy 2 the bit I'm going to skip over this exact story gets repeated with several more tribes several more people right that's why I'm not going to do it because it's just the same basic message but first it's the descendants of Esau then it's these people then these people then these people because now God is taking them on a beeline toward the promised land right so he has to they have to pass through relatively hostile people and this keeps going all the way until they get to a, the land of his bond his bond uh, equates roughly to modern day jordan okay so his bond is the first place of the promised land so it becomes the land given to the tribe of reuben so everywhere he says no fighting no fighting just pass quietly through mind your own business you know what i mean obey me walk pay your way don't be the cause of trouble don't start a fight notice he says that if you do is he going to be with them no he says don't start a war with them because i will not give you even enough of their land for you to put one foot on that's a Hebrew way of saying, or God saying to them, I won't give you even the smallest success. Because they are where I put them, and you are passing through the land that I say is for them. Right? It's only when they get to this place called Hezbon, east of the Jordan River, that that's the first time, and that's quite a bit further through in um, Deuteronomy 2, where he finally changes the instruction and then he now he says fight because i will be with you and i'll give this land into your hands because this is the beginning of the promised land the first chunk of it god does the fighting god does the fighting so on page two uh, i should point out that um the people in his bond were something called amorites amorites were like a subgroup subgroup of the canaanites and you know most of the promised land is the land of cana right descended from cain cain and abel so they're descended from cain canaanite so there are wicked people god hates them i know it sounds extreme but that's what the scripture says that god hated the canaanites because of their they were so evil like incurably evil and that's why god had them basically god exterminated them from the face of the earth because of their wickedness, right? So this these people in Hezbon, the Amorites, they are the beginning of the Canaanite world when they first encounter it. It might interest you to know that Amorites elsewhere evolve into over time, those same people evolve into what became Babylon. You know? So Babylon is like 
Kamer's Revenge, <laughs> if you like. Anyway, that's a different topic, but I thought I'd throw that in there for those who are interested. On page two, I've just put four points here that we can take for this, you know, for us. What's the meaning of this? Especially in light of the things that God's been saying to us in recent weeks. Because this, this isn't like a separate topic. This is really entirely built on what he's been saying to us the last few weeks. So the number one, though someone or a group or whatever, or the world itself is an enemy of us in spirit and maybe even actively hating us, we are forbidden to be the starters of war between us. You might end up in a war, but we are, we are forbidden we are forbidden from being the ones who start it. We don't go looking for a fight. You know? If a fight comes, that's different. But we don't we are not the ones who go provoking the enemy to battle. As far as it's up to us, we walk after the Lord who's brought us this far faithfully. Remember what he said to them, I brought you 40 years, you've wanted for nothing. So he's brought us this far, he will bring those who obey him all the way home. We must not be the cause or the beginnings of anything like war or conflict, unnecessary conflict. God will not be with us if we are the initiators of it. That brings to mind exactly what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 29. You know, we've covered that a few times in recent days. His instruction to just settle down and not rebel in Babylon. To quietly get on with increasing while, court, while giving Babylon no, ex, no reason, no excuse to become hostile. The two messages have a whole lot in common. So you understand what we're saying? So it's not like God doesn't know that we're in hostile territory. He's the one leading us through it. So his instruction's clear both here and in the in the whole, uh, if you like, the whole foundation and theme of, of Jeremiah's message is that, yep, you're in Babylon. God knows that. This is what you're going to do. No fighting. No thinking that you can have a rebellion. That was the other guy. Remember the false prophet Hananiah? Did he succeed? No, God struck him dead. <coughs> you know? Because we're living in a world that's under judgment. So those who want to pass through the judgment and come out the other side into the kingdom, we are on a journey that takes us through enemy territory. You know, you can't do a geographical, as we call it, where you think you can just go and live in a bunker somewhere till it's all over. The only safe place is in Christ. The only safe place to walk is where he's walking in front. So that's the first thing. Number three there. There will be people who will not obey this, even though they say they're Christians or whatever. Because they don't have any concept of waiting for God to leave, they will, like Hananiah and Babylon, they'll want to start something. It's already happening. It's already happening. I think, um, I can't remember what it was, last week or whatever, I said, you watch, they are like the people that are disobeying us in the church right now, the people that are disobeying us with the whole anti-vax thing and all that, shaking their fists and placards and walking around with the mongrel mob and all that, right? I said, you watch how what happens to them. They are like Hananiah. They are like the king that didn't take the easy judgment. He thought he could overcome Babylon by teaming up with Egypt, remember last week? So if you team up with the world, with the pagan world, to take on the judgment that God has sent, God himself will fight against you. Your judgment will get far worse, not better. And I said, you watch, 
they'll walk right into this trap and become the ready-made scapegoats for when it all goes wrong. Adern and co will have the perfect scapegoats to just go, well, it wasn't us. It was those people. They're the reason you're still in lockdown. They're the reason you're this, that, and the other thing, you know? So today on the news, just before I came here, I had a quick look at the news. What do we find? One of those anti-vax protesters has physically attacked a media reporter. Like physically attacked them down south today. Now it's all over the news. You see where it's going? They initiated violence. They might be the enemy, but if you initiate the violence against it, will God be with you? No. What will the end of it be? Instead of an easy judgment, it becomes 70 years in Babylon in, the, in the, um, Judah's case. I hope that makes sense. Key thing is, we are not to be the cause of it. We're not to be the cause of it. And to remember, it's not the kingdom. This is not the kingdom. This world is just a wilderness journey on the way, so we need to pass through this portion of the trip, which is going to be dominated by people that, frankly, they will hate us. We will, we will end up scapegoated, for sure. Because the pagan world will not discern between those disobedient Christians mm -hmm. and us. You know, so their actions will get us all scapegoated in the end, right? But it's okay. Jesus has warned us these things will happen. You know, he said that, right? He said, I'm telling you these things now so that when they happen, you will not be overcome. What knocks people over is things they don't expect. So if you understand they're coming, and Jesus, this is what Jesus said when he talked about what will happen in the end. He, he said that, I'm telling you now. So that when these things happen, you will not be overcome. So what overcomes people, what smashes them, is when things contrary to what they're expecting happen. That's when they fall apart and lose it. But if what happens is what you're expecting, it's easy. Well, maybe not easy, but certainly it doesn't, you know, it doesn't disintegrate you. We have to remember when it's time for war with Satan, will there be a time for war with Satan in his kingdom? You bet. Who's going to start that? <laughs> God. God will start it, God will fight it, and God will finish it. At no point in the proceedings does the church go out to war against Satan's kingdom mm -hmm. thinking that this is how we'll make the world a better place. Right? When, when that's been tried before, it ends appallingly badly. Like the Crusades of the 12th century, the Crusaders, that's what they were doing. They thought they could make heaven on earth by sailing off to recapture Jerusalem for Christ. Do you know that the Crusaders killed an estimated 30,000 other Christians on the way to Palestine when they ran out of food they just killed anyone they met and took their stuff. And when they got to Jerusalem, they killed as many Christians as Muslims because they couldn't tell them apart because they're all Middle Eastern. So if they look Middle Eastern, they just killed them. They didn't understand Jerusalem didn't need rescuing for Jesus. There was, always a, was already a massive Christian population in Jerusalem living quite happily. You know, when the church gets militant, when the church thinks that, well, God's not doing anything, we'll do it. We'll start this war. We'll rescue the world from Satan. History tells us, and the scripture tells us, God will not be with you. It will end appallingly badly every single time. Deuteronomy 2. The next scripture was Jeremiah 9, and I was a bit surprised that this came up again because I refer to it almost weekly, but we've never actually done it. So I'm not going to do the whole of Jeremiah 9 because, again, it's quite long, but I'm going to just take the key things out of it here. So we're at the bottom of page 2 now. 
This is how Jeremiah 9 starts, verse 1. This is God speaking. God speaking to um, Jeremiah. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears. I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the desert a wayfarer's lodging place, that I might leave my people and go from them. For all of them are adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. They bend their tongue like their bow, lies and not truth prevail in the land. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, declares the Lord. Understand what God's saying. On the one hand, you could say that he is thunderously angry because his own people have become so wicked. When they prosper, it's not by doing good. It's through evil and lies. They're actually as dodgy and as you know, deceitful as the pagans around them. They prosper through deceit, through lies, through schemes, right? Just like the pagan world. Well, that's a pretty good description of most of the modern church. The prosperity teachers, all that other stuff, right? We could go on and on and on, but I have gone on and on and on for about 25 years, so let's not do that, okay? But you know what I'm talking about. This is exactly what God is complaining about. His, it's um, Jeremiah, right? So he's, put this, he's complaining about Judah and Benjamin, the two tribes that hadn't already gone into captivity in Assyria. They were even worse than the ten tribes. They were doing like the worship of Molech. You know, to get yourself a blessing, you took your own child, Imagine taking Tobiah and going down into the valley at, uh, called, a place called Gehenna, which is where they burnt the rubbish outside the city. So fires burn day and night because the whole city is bringing rubbish and just keep adding it. So the fires never went out, right? That's where the picture of hell comes from, from Gehenna, the rubbish thing. Molech worship, they built a giant bronze statue of this, of Molech, it's a demonic entity, right? With an opening in it. It's bronze, right? So imagine the temperature inside, it's in the middle of these fires. And they throw their children alive into it. Alive. And then ask Molech for a blessing, since I've given you my child, give me a blessing. This is Jewish people in Jerusalem, doing that. That's the context of what God's saying here, right? And yet, look how he starts. If only I could, if only I had somewhere I could just go away and cry and cry and cry. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears. I might weep day and night for the slain of my people because of the wickedness amongst them. It's really important to capture this understanding of God. Yes, he's angry, but it's an anger that's driven by grief and concern for the victims of what this backsliding and sin have created. And if you've been around as long as me, you will know that the apostate church has left a trail of ruined and smashed lives behind it. You know, people who've been ripped off by money churches or who've been abused. Yeah, we won't go there. We all know the, the cases of that. It doesn't take long before you, you realise how sick the whole place is, right? But no one seems to remember that all of that, all, all of that wickedness has victims. That's who God's weeping for. Right? So it's a mixture of intense anger and intense sorrow. And he wishes he could basically just, if he had somewhere he could go and hide from us and pretend we didn't exist, basically, he would. Why can't he? 
Why can't he? Because he's made promises. He has covenants to keep. So for his own name's sake and for the sake of this covenant, he acts contrary to what we deserve. Grace, undeserved favour, is not driven by us being worthy of anything. Grace is because God is righteous. Having made a promise, he will not break it. Having made a contract, he will not break it. Having spoken, he will not fail to do it. In spite of us. So people think grace is an aspect of God that's kind of a bit uh, mushy, you know, because he's a bit of a big softy. His grace is driven by his righteousness. Having made promises to the patriarchs, having made promises through the prophets, that even when the people only deserve to be completely annihilated, he cannot go back on his word. It's not his character does not permit him to do so. I need to get my right page. Okay. He talks about the reason that they're like this is because the whole land is operating on lies. Lies and deception. They love, and the people love it that way. You know, these are the people who are supposed to know him. Instead, they are delighting in a society that's run on lies, half-truths, and schemes. Turning over to page 3, this should bring to mind 2 Thessalonians 2, which we've done many times. Why does God send Antichrist in the end? Because they would not love the truth. It comes to the same point, where especially his own house, and I'm sure this isn't the truth anymore. The whole of the house of God is operating, no different than the pagan world, on lies and schemes and, frankly, scams, you know, that we see all the time. And then I'll say stupid things like, oh, well, there's no such thing as a perfect church. Like, that's an excuse. Oh, all have fallen short. Like, that's an excuse. Drives me nuts. They do this. They think that the fact that man has fallen and that there's no such thing as a, as a perfect church is a license to knowingly and deliberately be doing something dodgy, worse than dodgy. If they think they can get away with it in the sight of God, they are dreaming. Anyway, he goes on next to say these things which are important for us. Verse 4, and this we need to understand this is for us to, uh, to know about now in the immediate sense. Let everyone be on guard against his neighbor. Do not trust a brother because every brother deals craftily and every neighbor goes about as a slanderer. Everyone deceives his neighbor and does not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. They weary themselves committing iniquity. Your dwelling is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit, they refuse to know me, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will refine them and assay them. For what else can I do because of the daughter of my people? Their tongue is a deadly arrow. It speaks deceit. With his mouth, one speaks peace to his neighbor, but inwardly he sets an ambush for him. So that's, you know, appearing Christian and nice, but in their heart, the dead opposite. You find lots of that at the moment. Shall I not punish them for these things, declares the Lord? On a nation such as this, shall I not avenge myself? So, that's Old Testament, right? Jesus actually repeats this in Matthew 10. So we'll read that straight away. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Remember Deuteronomy 2? <clears throat> I'm sending you into a dangerous place. Like sheep, not very powerful, easy target, 
amongst wolves. Dangerous. Therefore, so since that's going to be the case, be as shrewd as snakes, but as innocent as doves. Come back in a sec. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues on my account. You will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of God speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. I just pause there for a second. Remember Deuteronomy 2, don't start the battle. So I really, hopefully you, some of that will be going ping, ping in your head, listening to what Jesus is saying. Sheep amongst wolves, I'm sending you through this hostile place, right? Be on guard. Why? <laughs> it's a hostile place. You can't, just because I'm leaving you, you can't like stumble along passively thinking, oh, she'll be right, it'll be all right in the end. This requires application. You can't be a lazy Christian cruising. You actually have to be a disciple walking in obedience with your eyes open, listening to God in his direction because it is a dangerous place. Here it talks about your enemies, the ones that are going to betray you being your own relatives. Who was God warning about in Deuteronomy 2 that they had to be careful of? Their own relatives, right? Just because they're your relatives doesn't mean that they're safe. So here's something we need to understand, right? Everyone assumes everyone right now is probably looking at their brother or sister in the room going, I thought you were a bit dodgy. You know, your primary family is the church. You have one father and he's in heaven, remember? So this primarily means your greatest danger is inside the church, not outside. Think of Jesus. Who did Jesus have to be most careful around? The Romans? No, the Romans basically couldn't care less. He was a no one to them, wasn't he? Remember how hard the Sanhedrin had to work to get Pontius Pilate to even be interested in Jesus at all. Right? It's not the pagan world that will be your primary danger. The primary danger comes from within God's house. Those who say they are brothers and sisters, but are not. Very important to understand, this does not mean you go around looking at every other Christian, paranoid, you know. It just, you do what it says here. You be alert. You be, stay awake. You... If you are a real disciple, how can I put this? Hopefully, you've all had the experience where you meet someone for the first time, you know nothing about them, but before they say a word, you know they're a Christian. The spirit in you recognizes the spirit in them. And when they tell you that they're a Christian, it comes as no surprise, it's like you already knew that, right? Discernment. Being alert in God's house, being alert knowing that at the end, the really dangerous ones will, will be the religious people. Right? Your relatives in a God sense, as opposed to your people with the same surname, right? It might coincidentally be that they're the same person, people if your whole family is churchy and half the family, you know, really disciples and the other half aren't. It might coincidentally be your actual brother or sister, but that's not its primary meaning. Think of Jesus. He's the role model. He tells you what it means by what happens to him, right? You have to use your discernment. 
again, knowing, knowing that some, not all, will turn out to be snakes. You know, some, not all, will turn out to be like the Pharisees. Going back to Deuteronomy 2, when God told them, don't be the one to start the war, what else did he say? He said, they will be afraid of you. Esau will be afraid of you, right? That's what happens. Why, why were the Pharisees so desperate to have Jesus dead? They were terrified of what he represented. That's what happens to us. False Christians become really afraid of real Christians. False Christians come under conviction around real Christians. We make them unbelievably uncomfortable. What's the fastest way to get rid of something that makes you uncomfortable? Exterminate it. Get rid of it out of your life, right? If you can't make it be quiet, then you shoot it or whatever. It's that kind of context, that human thing, because they're not driven by the Holy Spirit, they're driven by the fallen nature, right? They don't really know Jesus. They have a form of religion, but they're not born again. So, remember what I said before, God warns us of these things, not to terrify us, quite the reverse. If you know he has said, without doubt, without question, this is what will happen, whether it's Deuteronomy 2 or here or today, then when it happens, you'll go, oh, I know about that. I know what to do. <laughs> you know, be Christ-like. It happened to him. It happens to his disciple. It's no more dangerous to you than it was to him. Your, your protection is that you're in him. But if you... If it happens to you and you don't understand this, you will think the world has ended. A sense of betrayal will do you in. Does that make sense? Forewarned is forearmed. You know, if you, if you know to expect that it's going to happen sooner or later with someone, not everyone, but now and again, you're going to have this experience, right? So the only people in the room who are exempt are anyone in here who's not actually breathing anymore at the moment. Right? So if you're still breathing, you're going to have this experience. Right? So understanding that means when it happens to you, it doesn't smash you over. <clears throat> you, under, you comprehend what's happening to you, so it's not overwhelming. Does that make sense? It doesn't mean it won't be uncomfortable. It doesn't mean that there won't be tears and all the rest of it. It means you won't be overwhelmed and destroyed by it. Is that right? Because sometimes it's the people you really least expect that do it. Remember, we've got to keep in mind that in this, at, the, at the end, the love of most will grow cold or fall away. And they'll try and take you with them. They will. To make themselves feel more justified, they'll try and get you to agree with them. You know, and when you don't, they'll turn on you. You know, and it might be people really dear to you. So we have to understand this really, really well, for it to not overwhelm us. Thankfully, thankfully, if you stay in decent fellowship and if you look after each other and you if you work to preserve each other's faith, building each other up in the truth, then you won't be short of people who are not doing this to you. You know? So even if you experience this, you just go, you just say, well, bye. You know, and you go back to the people who are on the <coughs> solid rock, and that's your family. Does that make sense? Another reason for not giving up fellowship, by the way, because if you're on your own and the people you thought you could trust turn out to be anything but, where you go, right? Let's carry on in Matthew 10. 
And so he says, you know, don't if you have to give account, don't worry. He will give you the words to speak at that very moment if you, because you are his witnesses. If you make it your business to testify to the truth in the, as he sees it, he, he will give you the words. He will be with you. He will deliver you out of it. Then right at the bottom, it says, oh, one thing here, verse 23, when you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. That sounds like cowardice, right? Actually, it's Deuteronomy 2 again. If you're not accepted, if you're telling the truth and it, you're talking to no one, do not pig-headedly sit there, you know, thinking that you'll launch this assault in the name of Jesus and beat them until they believe, you know. He will not be in that. He says if they won't listen, move on. It's not cowardice. It's not wasting the limited days of your life holding up placards to the blind and shouting at the deaf. You know, when you realize you've done all you can and it's still like, fuck it, move on because there's another guy around the corner who will hear unless you don't go and talk to him. Unless you stay here arguing with this crowd. You know, people get shocked with me when I just walk off. They're trying, to, they're trying to lock me in a fight. And if I know I've told the truth and it's still just, then it, they get really shocked when I'm like, see you later. Why? Well, I haven't got eternity to stand here waving a placard at someone I've just figured out is blind, can't see. How long do I wave it before I realize that they can't see it? You know? The... The enemy will constantly try and get you to blow years of your life trying to convince a person or this or whatever when it's quickly apparent that they aren't going to listen. So move on. It's not an act of cowardice running away like it might sound when you first read it. It's wisdom. What else do we need to know from there? Ah. So when we get down to verse 24 and 25, let's just quickly read that again. The student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It's enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house had been, had been called Belzebul, Belzebul is uh, an old... Uh, an, a very archaic word, a uh, Chaldee word, I think, for the Lord of the Flies. So it's a reference to Satan, right? Lord of the Flies. So what, who's the head of the house? Jesus. What's he saying here? If the head of the house himself is labelled the devil by these people who won't believe the truth, what will happen to people of lesser rank in that house, you and me. So we put it into modern terms. If these things happen to the boss, what makes you think it won't happen to you in the same circumstance? So do what he did. Do you, did you ever see him stand there having a punch up in Phil Allison? No. He would tell them, he might tell them twice, and then he left. You read that all in the gospel, isn't it? You know, when the, if they picked up stones to stone and what did he do? Call down lightning? It's not like he couldn't fight. Remember when they his disciples didn't want him to be crucified? And they said, You've got to save yourself, you've got to save yourself. What did Jesus say to them? Just to make a point here. He says, Do you not know that if I wanted to stop this? All I have to do is call to my father, and at once, 12 legions of angels would be at my side. Well, a whole human army couldn't deal with one angel, let alone 12,000 angels. Right? So he's making a point. Okay? But then, of course, he goes on to say, but these things have to happen to fulfill scripture. If I don't go to the cross, you don't get saved, right? 
So it's not that he can't, it's that he won't. So we have to have that kind of attitude. It's not, when you realise you're there, it's not that you can't fight, but that we shouldn't. For the sake of the guy around the corner who's waiting for you to turn up. You may not know he's waiting for you to turn up, but he's waiting for you to turn up with the gospel. Instead of being stuck in pointless, meaningless, head-banging contests with people who don't want to listen. This is about the gospel, right? But I tell you, the same is true. I'll just pick a topic. It's just true of dealing with humans. You know, so when you get those people, sometimes it's really tempting to think, I'm just going to stand here until I win. <laughs> For what? You know? To get their approval, to get them to agree with you, what will you have achieved? Nothing. Don't be the one that starts the fight. You know? If you're not accepted in one place, move on. Very important thing to understand. And that last one, verses 24 and 25, understanding that since these things happen to him, don't be surprised when they happen to you. It's normal. You're having a Christ-like experience. I used to say that in, <laughs> when I was teaching a class. I say, who wants to be Christ-like? Everyone would go, go to Isaiah 53. Why? Well, that tells you what Christ-like means. A man of sorrows, much acquainted with grief. What? Wait, I might even sign up for that. Yes, you did. Just put your hand in the air. <laughs> it's very important to your survival to understand what it really means to be Christ-like. It means you will have Christ-like experiences. So when they happen to you, it's, a, it's actually an honour, a privilege and a blessing, even though it hurts like hell. Does that make sense? You go, why is this happening to me? Because you belong to Christ. It's not happening to him. That's right, he belongs to the world. The world looks after its own and hates us. The world's Satan's domain, remember? That's why the wicked prosper in it. They are like Esau in the, in the hills. They, that's the place God has given them for the time being. Understand? Right. Let's go down. Uh, I think I might have covered, did I cover that bit at the bottom? Just having a look, I might have already covered the next, that next bit. Done that, done that, done that. Yes. So on page four, we're going to go straight to um, Jeremiah 9 and verse 7. So here we read, so it's still in Jeremiah 9, but now to verse 7, we read this. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will refine and assay them, for what else can I do? What else can I do? These words... Saraf and Bahan to refine and to assay. So, who's seen pictures of um, how they make steel from iron ore, right? So, how do you do that? It's at a refinery, right? What does a refinery do? What's the difference between a bar of steel and iron ore? Iron ore is full of impurities. It's not really worth much. How do you get the impurities out? <laughs> you stick it in the blast furnace, right? And then you pound it and roll it and stick it in the blast furnace until you've burned out all the impurities and you're just left with pure iron or if you add in some carbon and a couple other things, you get steel, right? So refining is the process of removing impurities by fairly drastic action, sticking you in the blast furnace. To assay is to, is to test the quality. So if, you, um, if you're 
mining and you think you found some gold, you will take it to the assay office and they will test the purity of what you found. They will tell you the gold content of whatever it is that you found. That's what the assay is. So God's saying that he doesn't have any choice with these wicked people. He says, what else can I do, right? When you say, what else can I do, what do you mean? It means I've tried everything else. You know, he sent them prophets and wise men and, you know, all these things, and yet they're like this. Remember how it started, God, the mixture of weeping and anger, how he's almost beside himself, he wants to go away and hide in the desert and pretend we're not there, that's how, you know, he's on the brink of having a, having a mental breakdown probably. So he gets to where he says, I don't have any choice. What else can I do? This is all that's left to me. This answers why you find yourself eventually under judgment. It's not like God sends judgment easily or randomly. It's Jeremiah 9. It's literally what's left. What else can I do? You've been sending people saying, repent, repent. Get out of this. Stop doing that. For decades and decades, and the church has ignored and just got worse and worse and worse and worse, exactly as Judah did. So it's the same thing. No options left. So I've got to refine. Guess what? Humanity is the iron ore. <laughs> How do you refine things? You stick it in the blast furnace. You know? What happens? Two things happen in the blast furnace. Impurities get destroyed. But what you're after gets refined. The same experience makes one thing purer and is the end of the other thing. That's what God's judgment does. It's not like the Christians are having one experience and the rest and the fake Christians are having a different experience. We all go through the same experience, but it has two profoundly different effects on, on the two groups. It has the call, it has the effect of separating the real from the fake. What God wants to keep from what will be burned up. So you think, what does the blast furnace look like? Well, the blast furnace looks like the COVID pandemic. It looks like economic crisis. It looks like the bulldozing of all our Christian culture. You know, people in the churches are completely spinning out that now you've got it's gay marriage, as of tomorrow, the law comes in that says you're allowed to abort old people or anyone that's, you know, the end of life act or whatever it's called. And, 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 right? So, like, pagan, wicked, and contrary to God things are now becoming the law. And the people love it that way. So if you're sitting there and you're comfortable with church thinking we are the victorious Christians, you know, nothing can touch us. You're in this world in which your world is vaporizing. You know, your comfortable churchy world is being like disintegrating before your eyes. And people are bouncing off the ceiling and shaking their fists and saying, it shouldn't be like this and blah, 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 blah. This is why it's so important to understand its judgment. If you don't understand its judgment, you will think that Satan is getting away with this and God can't do anything about it. God will start to shrink in your head and Satan will start to get bigger. And they'll cry out to God saying, God, you must stop it. It's evil. You must stop it. And then he, he won't. He doesn't. Why? He sent it. <laughs> The only weapon that works, is there a weapon that works against it? Oh, yes, there is. One, repentance. It's here because of wickedness. It's here because of the whole nation, this whole house, 
Remember, judgment begins with the house of God, right? So this is primarily about the behavior of his own people. The pagans just get dragged along, right? But they're spiritually dead already, so it hardly matters to them. The only thing that can avert judgment is for the cause of the judgment to go, which would require the repentance of the church. Personally, I think hell will freeze over before that happens. You know? You never know. I would love to be wrong about that. Not taking bets. But the key is the kind of arrogance, there is a kind of arrogance and pride in false church people who think, we're the church. Nothing can happen to us. That's the attitude of the Pharisees. Isn't it? We are God. We are Abraham's sons. You know, we are the we are the people of the book. Nothing can happen to us. It's that same kind of arrogance. What's actually happening is that everything they assume is just being bulldozed by a bunch of crazy lefties. You know, God hating, God hating liberals. They hate Jesus. They make no bones of the fact they hate Christianity because Christianity has rules, moral rules. They hate that. They would love Christianity to be eliminated from the world so that they could do what they like. Lawlessness, right? That's the spirit at work in them. Hates the spirit in you. Imagine, if you're not listening to this, imagine if you're in some church that's still like a kingdom now, dominionist sort of place that's thinks you are, that the church is just going to be triumphant and all that stuff. And then this starts happening. So you pray against it in Jesus' name and it keeps happening. And no matter what you do, it keeps happening. Because you don't understand the reason it's happening is because you are in a false Christian contrary to God contrary to his word practice and not just you all of these churches that have ordained gay ministers and happily divorce anyone for any reason and all of the things that drive God nuts right have youth groups which are just which are just a place to meet girls and sleep with them that's so rampant you know how do you think God thinks about that so his, when his own house is so wicked when his own house is running dodgy financial schemes or, you know, he will not come to the rescue of that. He sent this judgment because of that. The only weapon that works is repentance. You won't realize you need to repent as a church unless you realize that where is God in the picture? He sent this. You know, he's not hiding in the corner. He's above it all. He sent it. It is subject to him. The only one that can stop it is the one who sent it. It has his authority to do what it's doing. You know, hence he says, don't start a war. I won't give you even enough space to put one foot on their land. I've given this, I've given this land to them for this time. Deuteronomy 2, remember? But the church thinks they can turn around and like spiritual warfare or some nonsense like that. Do you remember when COVID first came? Did you see the clip of Kenneth Copeland and his sidekick? I've forgotten his name now. And on national TV, he commanded in the name of Jesus. He commanded COVID to leave. Right? I wonder what Jesus thought of that. Oh, I can tell you what he thought of that. Because God prompted me to look something up like two days later. And then I kept looking it up for a week. So from the very day Copeland commanded it to leave America, the number of COVID cases in the country, which had been growing, for the camera's sake, if that's a graph, had been growing at about that pace, the day he commanded COVID to leave, the graph went like that. From the day he commanded it to leave, COVID exploded like wildfire 
across the country to the very day. No. Don't be the one to start the war because unless God is leading, unless it's God starting the attack, he will not be with you. Especially if what you're planning to attack is the judgment that he has sent to bring about repentance in his own house. That's what these people don't get, right? They don't get it. To refine. So all this stuff is designed to destroy what isn't real. What's rubbish in his sight. So if it wipes out churches, organisations, the same process that wipes out a bad church will reveal... 10 real Christians in it who finally at last realize they need to get out of it and run where? Run to him. Do you understand? To get that little bit of steel, he'll burn down, you know, 20 tons of bad ore to get the little bit of steel out of the smelter. One experience, two different outcomes depending on whether you're the real thing or you could be made into the real thing. And that other word, Bakan, to say, he's constantly examining. He's causing, you know, Jesus says there's nothing hidden that will not be uncovered, revealed, right? That's related to this idea. So in the process of refining, it will reveal those who are real, and it will reveal those that are not, because that process will disintegrate them. Does that make sense? So even though God is using a wicked agency, we've done this before, his purpose is righteous. He might be using a wicked agency, or he is using a wicked agency, but his purpose, his long-term goal, is to refine and to reveal what's really his and what isn't. Then we... Still in that same scripture, the last part, verse 9, he says, Shall I not punish them for these things, declares the Lord? On a nation such as this, shall I not avenge myself? Avenge myself. Well, he's asking a question, right? What would the church, what would most of the church, modern church say? Oh, no, Lord, you have to be merciful. You can't do that. You're merciful. You know, just look the other way. Just forgive them. You know, just forgive. We've had the we've you know, we've had someone we've been dealing with for a while that has this attitude. Most of you won't know, but some of you know, so I'm not gonna name them but overseas. But they want to be forgiven without repentance. You know? They just they just say, You have to forgive but they don't have to repent, right? So what's God saying here? Don't I have a right? It's my law. It's my standard. I've given you what to do, and you won't do it? Shouldn't I do something? That's what he's saying. Shouldn't I do something? The false church or the blind, uh, rather than calling them false, those who are still blind, who still don't get it right, they will go, oh no, you just have to forgive. But what is the problem? We turn over to page five. The problem is not seeing things from his perspective. Remember how in the recent weeks God's been reinforcing to us? We have to take up a cross, we have to get up on the cross and see it as he does. We need, you know, the view from the cross. If he says, if you're, if you're seeing it as he does, if you understand what Jesus went through to make the opportunity for salvation, imagine the suffering of Christ. Sinless, innocent, and he went through all that to make it a possibility of salvation. And then his own house are doing this. If Jesus says to us, don't you think I should do something? Don't you think that I can't look the other way? Don't you think that in the end, I have to act? If 
if you're out there on the cross with him, what are you going to say? Aren't you going to say, of course you do. You can't just let this go on forever and ever and ever and do nothing. You know why? Because then those who are trying to obey will become discouraged that wickedness goes on and nothing ever happens to them. You know, why am I suffering to be good when those who are so obviously couldn't give a toss about you in your own house get away with murder and you do nothing? That destroys people's faith more than anything I know. You know, the bad behaviour of people in churches when good, real disciples see that over and over and over and they cry out to God, Lord, we never do anything about this. So this is what God is saying. Shouldn't I do something? The answer is, yes, Lord, you should. And you know what? He has. He has. And I've said here, you know, some people will scream, oh, that's Old Testament, God doesn't do that anymore. Well, just read the book of Revelation. Read Thessalonians. Read anywhere in the New Testament. And you'll find that, oh, yes, he does. Yes, he does. That God that never does anything, who just looks the other way and just smiles and forgives and pretends nothing's happening, is a make-believe Jesus fiction of the false church. You know, nothing at all related to the real Jesus whatsoever. So, the good thing is, though, when God avenges himself, it's always with a view of bringing about repentance. You know? So when God avenges, when he says vengeance is mine, the Hebrew understanding that has always been that he will do what he said. He will demonstrate that he is God. I'll show you why you should obey me. I'll do the thing I said. Which can be scary if he sent prophets saying, if you don't behave, this is going to happen. So what vengeance does he do? He does the thing that he said. He demonstrates that he is in fact God. He really turns up and that's the thing. Now, if you understand that God has been, and we have to have this view, right? So if you're a real Christian, you don't have any choice about this. You must agree with him that what he's doing is right. Why? Because he's perfectly right to judge New Zealand. He's perfectly right to judge the USA, etc., etc. Because of the wickedness of the church and all other. To say that he's not, to suggest that he's not right to send judgment is to buy into lawlessness. To say that these things don't matter. You know, that his righteousness can just be put on a shelf. When you can bring yourself to agree with him that he is perfectly right and just to do these things, in fact, if he were to go the whole way and just vaporize the earth, he would be right to do so objectively, impartially, he'd be right to do so. That's when you'll be at last in the right frame of mind, in the right view agreeing with him to get what he's actually doing. He's sending us to bring about repentance. He could just destroy us. Remember? But he has covenants to keep. He always preserves a remnant for himself. Whenever judgment falls, he always preserves a remnant for himself, right? To maintain his covenant, to keep his promises. If you can get to the same view as him, if you can understand it, you'll stop being afraid of it. You'll realize that what God has to do to the earth is to save a remnant. Want to be saved? Do the things that make you part of the remnant. If you're part of what's fake, stop being part of it. Get out of that church. Get out of that whatever it is, you know, that he convicts you of. If you realize you're part of why the judgment's falling, stop being part of the valid reason. This brings us back to not starting a war. What's not like, you know, taking this other approach. If the valid reason is the church is so disobedient and won't do things his way and won't obey him, and this is his instruction, and they do the opposite, all it does 
is it makes the valid reason he had to send judgment on them even more valid. Their continued disobedience. It makes it even more valid that he turns up the gas. You understand? He is righteous and just to do so. Remember, he doesn't play favourites. He hates partiality. He is impartial. He doesn't play favourites, right? So you don't get any special favours because you're wearing a big pointy hat or you're a bishop or whatever. No. Let's go on. Uh, verse 12. Who is the wise man that may understand this? And who is he to whom the mouth of the Lord has spoken that he may declare it? This is why the land, uh, this is the land ruined, laid waste like a desert, so that no one passes through. The Lord said, because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, nor walked according to it. So his law, his voice, his word, is Jesus, right? You can replace that whole sentence with Jesus. So when that when what he's talking about there comes in person, it's Jesus we're talking about. So we could say there, they have forsaken Jesus, my son, and not walked according to him at all. They have walked after the stubbornness of their heart and after the, after the Baals. Now remember, that's a Hebrew word for husband. right? So remember, we're not married, we're betrothed. When God says they have walked after another husband, it's adultery. So you're supposed to be betrothed to me, but you are giving yourself to another husband. Spiritual adultery, idolatry. You're bowing down to another God. What's the worst God you could bow down to? There's one God that's that God... Uh, wants you to avoid more than any other and all the hollywood watchers would go oh that'll be the devil satan no something far worse than satan yourself self the fallen nature when you become your own god your own god when you think you are god when you become your own antichrist. You know, antichrist means in place of, right? So those who have walked out of the stubbornness of their heart, that's what God means. You have acted like there is no God. You have made yourself God. You think that whatever your own wicked heart wants, your own, you know, greedy stomach wants, describes the world we live in. You have betrayed your true husband to run after this other thing. So, you know, if you become a Muslim or you become a Buddhist, that's bad. But not as bad, not as bad as making me being my own God, self. Self and they basically worshiping themselves. Worshiping self. That's what they teach in Buddhism. Oh yeah, but that's a whole modern world. That's what they teach in school. You send your kids to high school, they will be taught this, that you are the most important thing in the universe, that what matters is what you want. Your goals, your, you know, me, 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 me. Worship self, right? It's the same sort of philosophy that I would use to use as the self of all. Yeah, right? no idea. That's the most wicked God with a little g that there is. Right? Remember, this is the fall of man is the reason we're here. <laughs> you know, thinking that you could be smarter than God. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed them, this people, with wormwood and give them poison water to drink. Wormwood and poison water. Wormwood is like creates bitterness. And poison water 
Anyone care to guess what poison water is pointing to? There's a bit of midrash, the contrast. The opposite of poison water would be pure, clean water. What's that a picture of? Holy Spirit, right? What do you think poison water is? I'll give you another spirit, one that will kill you. Antichrist. I'll give you poison water to drink. You'll drink it and you'll die. He will hand him over to Antichrist. That's the Old Testament way of talking, of saying the same things at 2 Thessalonians 2, when he hands him over to that delusion that causes him to be given over to Antichrist. I'll, make, I'll give you what leaves you bitter, and I'll give you another spirit that will kill you. I'll scatter them amongst the nations. The nations are the people who are outside of the covenant. So I'll send you out of my house. I'll scatter you amongst the pagans, those who don't know me. But you don't want to know me. I'll scatter you amongst those who don't know me. Um, whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send the sword after them until I have annihilated them. Does that sound like a good time? No, but that's what happens when God sends Antichrist. This is a description of the, what happens to the people who will receive the mark of the beast. Remember when we did the mark, you don't get an option? If you get the mark, it's because you're already under judgment. You know, the real judgment is when you refuse to love the truth, you refuse to repent, that you wouldn't be instructed, you couldn't be turned. So what does he do? He hands you over to the delusion that causes you to follow Antichrist that inevitably causes you to receive the mark. If you, if you can't remember that, just go back to that study. I think it was about, was it two weeks ago or three weeks ago? Or something? Not that long ago. But it's serious, right? Because once that happens, we don't come back. No one who receives the mark enters the heaven, and no one who receives the mark has any hope of salvation. It's over. It's permanent. Just like this. <coughs> Just like this. Uh, now, the next thing we need to see, still for Jeremiah 9, still part of the warning. Remember we've been talking lately about how God judges the heart, not the outward appearance. Remember that? Oh, sorry, I need to turn the page. That would help. Thinking, why does it not say what I'm expecting? I'm on the wrong page. Here we go. So, Jeremiah 9, verse 23 now. Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might, let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Let's pause there for a minute. What he's saying is, the only thing that's going to matter, if you want to boast about something, if you want a reason for valid boasting, there's only one category that's valid for boasting, that you know him, that you actually for real know him, right? But if your boasting is about your money, you know, a fool and his money perish together, it's an old saying. Or your strength, or your human wisdom. There's nothing dumber than human wisdom. It's like the climate change conference or whatever, right? They're all there and they're going about science will save us, science will save us, without actually clicking that it's science that got us here. If it wasn't for science and human wisdom, we wouldn't have cars, we wouldn't have factories we wouldn't have had medicine that made the population go from 1 billion to nearly 10 billion in the space of just 50 years, when it had been 1 billion for almost all of the previous of human history. So it's actually human cleverness and science that 
is the reason that we're in trouble. So what do they reach for? Human wisdom and science. Are they going to succeed? No. Not a bit. I don't want to talk about climate change, but just to give you an example, they've all agreed we have to cut emissions to 50% by 2030. The same week, China and India, the two biggest polluters, both announced that there was no possibility of them reducing their coal burning. In fact, they needed to increase it until 2060. <coughs> Are they going to succeed? Of course not. Not even remotely. It's not rocket science, right? This is what God's talking about. If you're going to boast, have a reason for valid boasting. Because the only people that are going to come out of this ultimate testing of the whole planet are those that know him and walk after his ways. A remnant that he saves out of the judgment. The ultimate expression of that is the, ra is the rapture and resurrection, right? The remnant that he snatches away. So he's saying here, if you go to boast, don't boast about your wisdom. That'll just, that'll just prove how stupid you are. And don't boast about your strength because, you know, it's a whole Bible lesson, isn't it? How relying on human strength is a, is a recipe for disaster. And the same, boasting about your money. Your money can't buy your way. You can't buy your way out of what's coming. It's not a chance. Now, verse 25, which is really critical about the difference between who you are really inside and who not. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, that I will punish all who are circumcised and yet uncircumcised. Pause there. What is circumcision a sign of? Yeah. So it's an outward sign, a physical sign, that you are in the covenant with God if you're Jewish, right? And for Christians, where are you circumcised if you're Christians? In the heart, right? Inwardly. So the key is, not outwardly, inwardly. Look what God says next. Egypt and Judah and Edom and the sons of Ammon and Moab and all who are inhabiting the desert who clip the hair of their temples, for all the nations, all, are uncircumcised outside of the covenant. And all the house of Israel are what? uncircumcised in heart. Israel is circumcised physically. You know, with a snip. But God says, meaningless. They're uncircumcised in heart. Meaning, inwardly, the real person, remember we did this last week, was it? The inner you, the real you, that the heart represents. Where God says, I don't, I pay no attention to outward appearances. God judges the thought and intent of the heart. He says, inwardly, this whole nation are uncircumcised. In your innermost being, you look Christian. You have the outward appearance of Christian. But I know that inwardly, you're the world. Maybe worse than the world. The world at least has an excuse of ignorance but you don't. Hence, judgment begins with those with the least excuse, right? This house. All of this is all part of Jeremiah 9, right? We have to read those two things together. There's valid cause for boasting for those who really know him. Because those that really know him and can boast that they really know and understand him. That they have that relationship where they really can, and particularly they can therefore see things from his view from across. They, of course, are not counted in what he's saying here. He says, the reason I have to do this is not only is the whole pagan world pagan, but my own house is pagan as well. You know, there's only a remnant who can save out of this. 
very important to understand. Now we come to the last scripture, which is Obadiah. So Obadiah is just 21 verses long, one single chapter. It is the shortest book in, oh, oh, Alec, take notes. Obadiah is the shortest book in the Old Testament. So when it's your turn for Bible study, Obadiah. I've got it. One page, right? <laughs> Sorry. <It's other> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so, you know, so when it's your turn, you say, I'm going to do a whole book in one night. And they'll go, what? Yeah, all 21 verses. Anyway, so Obadiah is a prophet at the end of the Assyrian Empire and the beginning of the Babylonian Empire. So he's in that crossover time where Assyria is being destroyed and, and Babylon is rising. And he's a contemporary of Jeremiah. So he's like a, you know, God always has two witnesses, right? So God's had us in Jeremiah, and now he has us in Obadiah, who's Jeremiah's contemporary. Obadiah has a particular message, though, and I think this is of a special importance to us, something we have to really take to heart, Obadiah's message, right? So I think we can go... Over to page, yeah, we'll go over to page seven in a second because the rest I could do off the cuff. So remember back in Deuteronomy two, we had the we had how they had to be careful passing through the mountains of Seir, right? Which is the land where God allowed Esau's descendants to live. So they are they are Abraham's children, right? They, uh, Esau, of course, is not part of the 12 tribes, so he's not part of Israel, but they're relatives, right? Wind the clock forward to the time of Jeremiah and Obadiah. They're still in the mountains. Remember, they weren't, they weren't allowed to have war with them. But the, the Israel is so powerful that Esau's people live subject to them. So that old bitterness is still alive, you know, because they've been sitting up there in their mountain looking down at, you know, the, the 12 tribes down there thinking that's supposed to be us. That's supposed to be us because their, their ancestor robbed our ancestor of his birthright, you know. So there's that sort of ongoing bitterness. And... Remember what we learned the other week that it was supposed to be a mild punishment by sending Babylon and forcing Jerusalem to surrender and have to pay taxes to Babylon. If they'd just done that and repented, that would have been it, right? But remember, Jehoiakim thinks that I can get rid of Babylon if I team up with Egypt. He tries that. It all goes horribly wrong. And long story short, Babylon, it's not happy. Babylon comes and instead of just a spank on the hand this time, they burn the city down, they destroy the temple, carry all the gold, everything in the temple is carried back to Babylon along with the people. And that is the beginning of the 70 year um, captivity. Why? So they initiated the war. <laughs> You know, they disobeyed the things we've just been learning about. Object lesson, right? But here's the thing. Esau is watching from the mountains. When they saw Babylon destroying Jerusalem, when they heard of it, what do you think they did? Payback. Esau came and helped Babylon destroy the city. Esau came and helped Babylon destroy the temple. They held party that their relatives had been wiped out, that their relatives had been carried off as slaves to Babylon. You know? And they helped the Babylonians gloating and laughing and saying, ha, ha, ha. Look what happened to you. Their own relatives. Right? Never mind the few, 
their relative. Obadiah is sent to prophesy concerning what they did. So the first thing we have to understand is from Ezekiel, well, top of page 7. We need to understand something about God's attitude, right? When God is judging, and even when God's destroying things, and even when he has to throw the wicked into the lake of fire, people say, oh, well, you know, what a mean and horrible God, you know? How could he be, you know, he's, how can anyone be like that? Terrible, terrible. It's a complete slander of God's character. Remember back in Jeremiah, he says, what else can I do? You leave me no choice. Run out of options. So I have to do this. In Ezekiel 33, something is revealed of his nature there. He says, Son of man, say to the Israelites, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord. Note this. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? What's wrong with you? Why will you not just repent? Do you think I want to destroy you? Do you think I take any pleasure in doing this? But he has no choice, remember. When God sends a wicked into the lake of fire, he will be weeping like in Jeremiah 9. Oh, that my head were a fountain of tears. You understand? But he has no choice. He cannot permit that into heaven. So with that in mind, so even when he sends Babylon, and even when he has Babylon destroy his own temple and carry his people off into captivity because they've left him no choice, he's weeping, not laughing. Down the mountain comes Esau, who are their relatives, going, Woo! Right? Didn't know six-year-olds could do that, did you? <laughs> All right. I have my secrets. I have my secrets. You don't see what happens when the disco lights are going. <laughs> Trust me, no disco lights. Anyway, let's let's see what Obadiah is sent to say. So Obadiah is quite short, but we don't need to read all of it, right? Because this, these couple of bits here will suffice. Because Obadiah is like a single purpose book, you know, so it really has a pretty simple one, one purpose message. Obadiah 22. See, and he's talking, to, he's talking about Edom. So Edom and Esau are the same place. Okay. See, I will make you small among the nations. You will be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the cleft of the rocks and make your home on the heights. You who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down. Because of the violence against your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame. You will be destroyed forever. On the day you stood aloof while strangers, that's the Babylonians, carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. You should not gloat over your brother in the day of his misfortune, nor rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor boast so much in the day of their trouble. You should not march through the gates of my people in the day of their disaster, nor gloat over them in their calamity in the day of their disaster, nor seize their wealth in the day of their disaster. You should not wait at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives or hand over their survivors in the day of their trouble. Do you get that? God has to do this to them 
but he takes no delight in it. You know, for him, it's a necessary evil, if in a sense, you know what I mean? Like he would rather not. He wanted them to repent. So this is like last resort, no option, nothing else he can do. He has to send Babylon, but he hates it. He just hates it. He wants to save them, not destroy them. Right? This is why he's so angry with Edom, you see. Because for them, it was like party time. Floating and like, ha, ha, ha. And God's saying to them, no, ha, ha to you, actually. Your cold and callous attitude to your own relatives. Right? This is, we have to be so careful with this. We have to take this to heart. Verse 15, he says, The day of the Lord is near for all nations. That's the whole earth. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. Heard that before? Yes, you have. That is Jesus saying that the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Jesus didn't make that up, right? It's Old Testament. What's God saying to them? These are your own relatives. Even if you have an issue with them, and they did, these are your own people. You should be weeping for them. You should be telling them to repent. You should have been there. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter that they, this is the key thing, it makes no difference that they deserve it, because they do. But just because they deserve it, it's no time for a party. You know, it's disaster among your own people and your own relatives. Why is this important to us? Because we will see people fall. We will see people not cope with what happened. We will see people imploding in their faith. And they will deserve it. We will know they deserve it. Right? Now it gets hard. If you're Esau, Edom, you'll sit there going, ha, I told you. Getting what you deserve. You know, no sympathy for me. You know, you should have listened. That's Edom. What will the Christian be like? You use the opportunity of their brokenness to say, this is what God said would happen and now it has. Will you not even now listen? And if they turn, snatch them up. You know? Because God still wants to save. Remember, he's done this as a last resort. Remember what it said in Ezekiel? I take no delight in the destruction of the wicked. I want you to repent. Seeing it from his view, you understand? We have to be very, very cautious. Especially if it's someone who's really hurt us in their apostasy. And then who do you think God is likely to send as his witness if he knows he can still bring them to repentance, albeit he has to smash them first to do it? You know, he has to smash the pride and arrogance out of them and leave them gasping for life before they finally go, I should have listened. But now it's too late now, I can't go back. You know the prodigal son thing? My father won't want me anymore. Who do you think he's most likely to pick as his witness? To be the person that represents his offence the most who that person offended most in Christ in this world is the best witness for Christ for their redemption. If they turn and repent, you if that's you, you are the best witness Jesus can use. But you can't be Esau. Look what God did to Esau. Edom is his other name. Does that make sense? 
because we can sit there and look at those churches going that are, you know, ordaining gay priests or promoting this or blah, 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 it doesn't matter what it is, right? And then if they fall to bits or those giant, um, there's so many that have fallen over already, that those mega churches that are like ghost towns now, half of them, you can sit there laughing, going, ha, 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 ha. Oh, no. That's Edom. We should weep with Christ for them. That will motivate you that should the opportunity arise, you know, and you have a choice about how you're going to be when someone, a survivor might come out and they, like as a prodigal son, and they really don't expect they'll be welcome. That's when the rubber hits the road. Does that make sense? Because the people he's talking about cannot be reached by evangelism. They think they know him, but they don't. Mm. Nothing you can say to them now will reach them. The only way they can be brought back is if God, in the refining, in the blast furnace, basically vaporizes the garbage that they trust in. You know? If it's really garbage, then the using this time of testing to destroy that, which will leave them there, you know, lost, dazed, and confused. That's the moment they might finally listen. Does that make sense? We have to be so careful not to sit there gloating and saying, ha, ah, told you so. No. Definitely not. Just to reinforce, we're on the bottom of page 7, just to reinforce that whole thing about God's attitude, we see in Luke 19, last paragraph on page 7, Luke 19, verse 41, as Jesus approached Jerusalem for the last time, he saw the city and he, what? Oh, he wept over it. He wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when, the en when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. That was fulfilled to the letter in AD 70. The Roman army built a huge siege ramp out of earth and stones up to the top of the wall because they couldn't breach the walls were impenetrable. So they just built a huge siege ramp up to the top of the wall and then six legions of soldiers marched up it into the city, killed everybody. When it talks there about, uh, where is it? They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. Roman soldiers would pick children up by the ankle and swing their heads into the stone wall to, to mm -hmm. smash their heads and kill them. It's killed everybody. Isn't that what the Nazis used to do? Yeah, so about, they estimate about a million dead. Why did they get angry? Well, angry because the rebellion had killed about 500,000 Roman soldiers. Yeah. You know, they rebelled against God's judgment. So the same pattern we've been talking about, the judgment escalated to where the city and the temple was destroyed. And this is, but what's Jesus doing? Jesus is saying, this is what's going to happen because you refuse the opportunity of salvation. Right? So from an objective, impartial, matter-of-fact point of view, he's saying, this is what's going to happen. But while he's saying it, what is he doing? Weeping. He takes no delight in the destruction of the wicked, but they will still be destroyed. Because he's righteous. We have to understand how the two things work together. You know? So if he's forced to destroy a nation, he has no time for someone who thinks that's funny. You know? He has no sympathy for someone who thinks that's good news. Because these are people he wants to, wanted to save. 
when he's driven to the point where you have to do that, right? Jesus shows you there that nothing has changed, that he and the Father are Echad, one, remember? So we are supposed to be his witnesses, we have to be like that. We have to have that dual thing going on. We understand from a point of righteousness, absolute justice, we have to agree with him. And when he says, shouldn't I avenge myself on a nation like this? Yes, Lord, you should. Objectively, impartially, rationally, lawfully, yes, Lord, you should. But like you, Lord, we won't like watching it. We won't take delight in seeing our enemies destroyed. We'll weep with you over them. So if the opportunity comes of snatching a prodigal son back, we'll be right there with you as your witness. Not gloating like the Edomites. So Edom is where Esau's people live, right? After after Alexander the Great, that name got changed to a Greek version of Edom, and it got changed to Iodomia. Iodomia is what King Herod is. King Herod, all the Herods, are Iodomians. So they're they are relatives, but they're not Jews. So the Romans picked an Iodomian, one of Esau's people, to be king. That's why they're so hostile. That's why he's a major picture of the Antichrist. What happened to him in the end? Not good. Right? So what what God said about them was absolutely fulfilled. The day of the Lord is near. What you have done will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon you. That's what Jesus taught. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And I think, well, I don't think I know, that's a message we have to really own. Because it would be so easy when things start happening, when churches start collapsing, even even complete nut bars like Kenneth Copeland and all that lot. When that collapses, you know, it'd be so tempting to go, yay! But we're not allowed to. We have to weep with Christ about it. Why is it bored? We're still going, boy. Well, we almost are. I think we're basically done, actually. On page eight. I hope you be that age, eh? Yeah. Uh, okay, on page eight, just a couple of things, which is the last we're on our home run now. So as I've said here, we must not share it eat on sin. We must have God's attitude, Christ's attitude about it, even when the judgment, even when the destruction is absolutely lawfully correct and proper. We should be weeping with him over the fact that it had to happen. The other thing that's warned of here, that Obadiah warns of, is that they joined in with the Babylonians in beating up, you know? We must not make alliance with pagan things. We must not, like, same as, um, you know, reaching out to Egypt for, in, an, in an alliance to defeat Babylon. Look what happened there. Look what happened to Josiah, right? History. Same thing here. We have to be very cautious of that too. And yet that's my great concern when I see people at the moment joining in all these protests because they think because they're protesting against something evil, the government, or a very evil government, which is part of the judgment, right? But you've got all these church people aligning themselves with things that are actually themselves anti-Christian. Your enemy's enemy is not your friend, if in fact they are actually your enemy, you know? So a warning, we're not to, we're not to join in with things that are themselves anti-Christian, not to make alliance with things like that just because they also don't like something we don't like. There is a lethal, lethal mistake. Thank you.
Okay, I think we can pretty much finish. There's a bit of a summary at the bottom. Should we just shoot through? It's that last paragraph, like a summary. So don't attack, no attacking, no starting the conflict unless the Lord himself starts it, unless he commands it when it's never to be us that starts the trouble. Might He might be end up in a war, but don't be the one that started it, right? Value above all else to know God, since the whole point of it is reconciliation with him, and that's all that matters in the end. Don't cling to what's already dead, this world. Don't gloat when judgment falls on your enemy. Do what you can to bring them to repentance, especially if, they, if you can see they're a prodigal son looking for a way back. Be the one to show them the way. Leave vengeance to God, because his idea of vengeance is to fulfill his word to save as many as he can. Okay, Even the ultimate case, the remnant of Jacob in the end, nothing will be more terrifying than that. But even that is designed to save people who are not presently saved. See everything from the cross. If you don't see everything from his point of view, you will get lost, dazed, and confused, and not understand, and make terrible mistakes see everything from his perspective because he's going to lead out a remnant and when he does he will gather them to himself and they will be his dwelling place in the last days they will be his witnesses in the last days a kind of revival but not as the church thinks of revival it will be about quality not quantity okay and my last line there says choose life for he has said, return to me and I will return to you. Remember the only weapon that works now is repentance. It's the only thing that made any difference. Okay, so remember the whole context of this was God warning us. Especially that last thing, I think. Because of the times we live in, He's like, we're wanting to be his witnesses. We care. The truth matters to us. So he's saying, yep, but even you must, must, there are things you must do that you not, are not going to be natural for us to do. You have to consciously obey these things. Being in agreement with him in spirit and heart, all those things, right? So, Study this a few times, especially for yourself. So we are so should those circumstances come, I'm pretty sure they will. You'll know what to do. Because you'll have to overcome your fallen human instinct to do the opposite. You know? Being Esau will be easy. Being Christ's disciples will take a deliberate conscious decision to obey him instead of the fallen nature. Okay, so on that note, that would make us done for another week. Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We pray, Lord, that these things, you would impress them on our hearts and upon our minds, Lord, that you would not let us forget them. We thank you, Lord, that you know how to save. You are mighty to save. You know who loves you and who doesn't really care. You know, Lord, who has their eyes set on the wedding, who's looking for the groom to come. You know the bride who's making herself ready, who's looking forward to it, Lord, who doesn't want to live in the wilderness, but to go home with you, for whom this world is a trial, a foreign place, because we are lambs surrounded by wolves. Nevertheless, you are the shepherd who goes ahead of us, who makes a way, you will do all the way. You will bring the faithful through. Those who endure to the end will indeed be saved. Give us a grace, Lord, not just to be saved ourselves, but to be agents of your salvation for as many as we can reach, as many as we can help, as many as are willing to come. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. That's it. Good night. Shalom.